Okay, guys, let's get started. We'll cover the new contract 7.0. Leanne was just bringing up a comment about who can use it, who can't use it. And the obvious thing is, yes, if you're a member of any of the listed boards, you can use this contract. Despite what you hear about being just a member of WAR or whatever comes into play, but you always got to keep in mind, if your client says, I'm good with it, you can still follow the direction of your client. Right? Because it's your client who then can be saying, I'm good with what I'm working with here. So because we are members of the Belvedere Board of Realtors, mm -hmm. this contract can fully be used by anybody that's a member of Belvedere Board of Realtors or working through Emory who is paying their dues with Emory. Okay, You're so good to go. I can't see what it is. The boards from here. They're all of them. I but mean, not, the Rockford board isn't on there, obviously. Nope. Then. Okay. That's good. their choice. So, McHenry well, County, Rockford board, Belvedere board, King County. Yeah. Main and when, so when they were telling us this at the RAR CE going over the seven right. miles, that's why I'm like, well, obviously yeah, right. it's got to be different for Belvedere board of realtors. Totally so, is. Okay, yeah. good. Good totally to different than the other. I've always used it whenever I get. Yeah. So we want to just start with that point of whoever can or cannot use it. Okay. Now, there's a lot of stuff within this contract that if you've seen the 7.0 before, it's very similar. So I'm going to go back to the beginning here, just so to clarify who can or cannot use it. But if you're just a member of the Belvedere Board, you can work with this. If you're a member of just the Rockford Board, in theory, yes, you're supposed to be following the guidelines and working with the RAR contract and the form and things too. The big difference is, is our customs in our area would typically lead to match up with the Rockford Board because of the obvious things, lacks of surveys, the use of attorneys, and various other things. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a major difference between our contract and the 7.0 contract, mm -hmm. and most of you probably don't realize this is the fact that in the 7.0, you are not authorized to receive any notices within the contract. Agents are not allowed to receive the notices, disperse notices, or do anything in regard to notices. So that's huge, and that's why in our suburban area, why we want the agents to simply turn it over to the attorneys and say, here it is, because that's the way that contract reads. Yeah, now, um, here's one thing on that, too, is that Lynn Marison had said that if there is no contact information for the client on the contract, then it also states that the realtor can receive the notice. We receive complimentary copies is what kind of comes down to. Okay. But we're not authorized to receive the actual notices. So it's a big difference when it comes to some of the presentational part of this thing that leads to it. Now, as far as there's no contact information, that applies to all of our contracts. You guys still would be shocked at how many contracts that I see come through that despite what I say you need to do, is you need seller and buyer contact information in there. If you don't get it when they send it across an offer to you from a buyer side, you should be counting the contract as nothing else but to counter it to get the buyer's information. Because what happens if I have to deliver notice and the agent doesn't accept it or refuses to accept it? Or especially if it's a home sale contingency and I do need to do a bump on the five paragraph five or our contract even. That has to go specifically to the parties. I can't send a notice to eliminate contingency through Nick and expect him to get it to his clients because when will it happen? However, because the information in the contract, the contract specifically says it goes to the parties, we have the ability to literally deliver the notice to eliminate contingency directly to them based upon their contact information. Don't have it, who do you send it to? Plus, it's not a perfect shift of liability in either contract. But there is some sharing of liability responsibility than if a notice goes to everybody involved. So if they just send the notice out to me, and then they also copy Nicole as the seller on it, I share a little bit of the liabilities now off me as a realtor. It's, she should open up her own email to some extent. So those are questions we kind of see, where did you get this and why did you wait so long to deliver notices? It expired two days ago. You know, contract commission right now, why didn't you get that done? I was busy. Those aren't excuses. But we've got the ability to kind of move things along in different ways too, if we think about it. So, and a contract gives us that right because of the notice clause, that it can be served upon the party, attorneys, whatever comes to play. Here it's attorneys and parties. So, 
Now let's just take a look at the general contract. I've highlighted, as you can see, we're not going to go through this whole thing word for word. Something comes up, let me know if you're reading through it on your own. We'll kind of backtrack on it and see what's going on. I picked out, basically I've highlighted things that are different in this contract from the 6.0 contract, as well as they may be different between this contract, the 7.0 contract, and how they're different from Lars' contract. Because that's one of the big things you get caught up on. You know, a lot of times you have I have a contract come in, I'll tell somebody, uh, you can't even close. Because you went and crossed out, for example, the survey writer in here. When you cross out the survey writer, your contract is basically unenforceable. So there's some things you gotta just be aware of the differences in them. So it's kind of interesting. We're looking at the top of the contract here, and you know how we typically expect to see the price and everything beforehand? They have moved the price farther down because they're clarifying some things in here ahead of time. Obviously the property itself is identified. Yes, there's needed spaces in here. And this is again designed because it covers such a big geographical area. I buy a condo in downtown Chicago. Do I have a parking spot that goes with it? If I have a legal description for my condo unit, then I've got a legal description that goes along with the parking lot that goes along with it. I literally am getting two deeds at that time. So it has to cover those things. Even though it doesn't apply to us here, it's something that could be from our perspective. So then it goes straight from legal descriptions and identifying the property straight down to the fixtures. Now here's my suspicion on this, is that because realtors messed this up so many times, they have taken this and put it right on the front page so we're taking a look at it from the very beginning, but it's also telling us that all of these things as far as personal property goes, how many times does a lender come back and say, you gotta take off this, 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 and this has to be taken off. Make sure it's personal property have no added value. So this contract has already taken out the thought of, we threw in the pool table, we threw in this, and the writing along and all the stuff they put in there, it specifically says there's no value to any of these things. It's pretty cool. They have to be in operating condition on date of acceptance. Here's a big change, guys. No added value, but it's being transferred by bill of sale. So in the olden days, Boone County's contracts had that. You had to have a bill of sale that went along with all the personal property. We don't in rock. So if this contract gets accepted, you will roll through our normal procedures, ordering out title work. You need a bill of sale also to go along <coughs> with it at the time of the closing. So it's an additional document that needs to be prepared and conveyed at that point. So it's not just as simple as a normal, typical roll out closing if you've accepted the, the deal out of a 7.0 contract. Are we going to be able to write up that copy? Mm -hmm. We need an attorney to do that. The bill of sale calls an attorney. You could, you could have actually have the seller do it, right? Yeah. Sure. Seller can always do it. Right. But how many off times do we have a seller that's capable of writing up a bill of sale? Right. You know, whenever I have the 7.0 yeah. contract, I always make sure my clients get an attorney. It just makes it so much easier. And even a lot of times on the Rockford ones, do I always suggest? Well, in a roundabout way, the yes. contract says pretty much they have to have an attorney. And you'll see that as we go through this, there's a lot more things that are evident here. But this is a major thing. It may only be five little words, but in theory, we shouldn't be walking away from the closing table unless we have that accompanying them. As you can see, this laundry list of personal stuff, it's pretty encompassing. There's not a lot of room on there for things not to be included within here. Again, what's not included has no value. Things on that line come into play. Obvious stuff, guys, again, watch for your water softener and propane tanks, all that kind of things. Make sure your people really do all this. What is hardscape? Like landscape bricks and timber bricks and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's the the sloping walls and all the things.
things that come along with the waterfalls here today. Okay. There's a ton of stuff in here, guys. A lot of stuff in here. Wouldn't that be fun to pull up and see the beautiful landscape breaking going around the side of the house and gone? Then <laughs> <laughs> Madison said that was happening. It happened. Yeah, it is. This stuff oh wouldn't be God. on here if it hasn't <laughs> happened. Yeah. If somebody did do something to create this wording, the wording was created because of a person doing something. The like tacked up carpeting is so funny that you would think yeah. it would just be logical to leave your flooring, but <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we'll road 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 you can take it. You can't take it. Uh, and then the cool thing on here is this is it again it brings it up. The system I should be deemed operating is performed the function for which it was intended. Doesn't matter if it's ugly or rusty or if it turns on and washes dishes or cleans clothes or you get water run through it or the attached gas grill starts and lights, even if the flame looks funky but it heats up, it probably is functioning. So it's, there's, they've done a very good job of taking out the what ifs throughout the entire contract, even with the side of the home inspection portion of it. Purchase price. Most important thing on it, it's just got a couple little simple lines kind of shoved near the bottom of the first page. So it's not that prominent because there's so much more in the contract that takes a bigger opinion on it. Credit closing. I love this. Credit closing, if applicable, and if the buyer allows it, lenders allows it to be on there and it can be used for everything so we can give you credit it's an exact dollar amount no doing calculations for it and it applies to anything they can use it for prepaid expenses closing costs or both so this is when the attorney says well you gave us 3500 bucks we've only used at 3000 with the lender so we want you to prepay our homeowners insurance they can do that so it gives them the ability now to literally use up that entire amount of money that you put in that box, even if it didn't totally fall within the lender. They can even prepay principal, interest, there's all kinds of weird things. So it's pretty open as to what they can use it for, but it's a total combination of stuff. Earnest money, you have to put a date. There's nothing even specific in here. So it's actually not a bad scenario because it actually does take the ability now at this stage of the game of saying, oh, I don't really need to do an earnest money note because I can ask for seven days, 10 days, five days, three days. It's negotiable. Now we're looking at the case for some of our company and then saying, I want this, but I don't want to bring you the rest of the money until we get past attorney's approval. So we have to pass the home inspection. We have to move our money out of our 401k, we have to move it in a checking account before we can actually send you the check to bring it in. So it's a negotiable feature as far as this goes. Additional earnest money still comes into play within this, similar to what they always had before. It's going to be held for the mutual benefit of both parties. We have a simple checkbox. Who's going to hold the money? <laughs> Seller's brokerage, buyer's brokerage, or somebody else that they've decided, which would be your title company in most cases. Earnest money shall be dispersed by paragraph 26. Nothing uncommon there, but there's some different provisions in there that are different than Rod. <coughs> we'll cover them when we kind of get to it. Closing. They made some changes in here too. So obviously we have the closing date. But it reads, closing shall take place at the escrow office, your title company. Of the title insurance company, it's underwriter, which now says, if you look at it, by being its underwriter, so if it's Chicago title, it doesn't necessarily mean we're closing with the Chicago title branch in downtown Chicago. It can be the Chicago title branch out here because it's an underwriter of the title insurance. And it's the closest office that they have to the property for the underwriter. So we always get the argument with the attorneys from the suburbs that say, well, I want you to close my office because I don't want to drive all the way out to Rockford. Plus, they want to charge title insurance fees for that area. Yeah, that's a whole different scenario, too. But now we've got this. Well, wait a minute, though. The contract says it's got to be the title company underwriter closest to the property, which now gives you the discussion of bringing it back out here, which should keep the cost under control. Should be doing a closing out here. You don't want to drive out here and do the closing. That's kind of what the attorney should be thinking about. So. I like the possession one too, how they've changed this up. 
where now considers a possession to have occurred, not necessarily at the closing, but possession shall be convened with point of selling all occupants and vacant the property and they give me the keys. So it's not considered really to be turned over and said, here it is. If we walk away and they don't give you all the keys at that point because they still gotta go get a cup job. Or they're going back to move all the garbage cans out of the garage or something to that effect. And the official possession isn't happening until they give you all the keys and they can. This is a better definition, I think, is what it comes down to. The financing, lots of different variations within the financing. So this one, the first one here, typical loan contingency. We don't put dates in no more. They have pre-printed the dates as far as the closing goes. So now we're gonna close, the loan has gotta be approved either within 45 days after date of acceptance or five business days prior to the date of closing. So closing is 60 days out. Basically we have 45 days for the loan approval to happen. I think based upon what we see with them a lot, it's probably not a bad number. We may get them done faster and quicker, but 45 days will save a lot of extension requests and watching dates and catching things because they've given themselves enough time to kind of make it happen. Now, if somebody wants to push a closing, then the 45 days gets overwritten by the five day scenario. So they say, we're gonna close this thing in 30 days. The automatic default date now for the loan approval now becomes 25 days. No more trying to figure out what's the magical date you want to put in here. It's already been done for you. This is all pretty typical throughout. It's a typical put in the rates, interest rates, things on that line. Uh, down in here, they've made some changes as far as the bottom part goes. So the buyer basically is unable to provide approval within the date specified top, 45 days or five days prior to it, then this contract should become null and void. It's done. So the burden of getting things done from a loan standpoint, a lender's perspective, still falls upon the buyer in the Amherst 7 rental contract. Their job to make sure it happens. So you still will get those extensions coming out of the attorneys. We'll watch them. So doesn't our, our contract say voidable? This is automatic. So if I wanted to throw the house back on the market the very next day, I yep. could easily do that. I get one or two phone calls from every one of you yeah, every week. Okay. Can we put it back? Can we do this? What's your seller want to do? You know? Because it says with the bank, let's get signed off, accept the contract. You put it back in them last because our sellers can dictate to some extent that these go back on. So yeah, this is automatic. It's done. So you will be getting those 445 emails from the attorneys asking for extensions when they realize oh, today was the date and the letter didn't come through like they promised today. So they'll be bouncing through it. Yeah, it's, we all know what it is. We know what they do. The fun thing is this, is that the seller shall have an option to declare the contract terminated by giving notice to the buyer. So we get nothing, and no written evidence shows up. We hear nothing from these guys, one way or another. It becomes null and void, but the seller, with specific wording here now says, he can kill the contract. So there's nothing about the loan commitment was mailed out that he got it two days later in the mail because they missed the dates and things. This allowed for the seller to have that right of saying, we're done, you know, putting an end to it. Which is not bad to say that it can go both directions on it. If that was the case, would the buyers get their earnings money back? If they get your loan? Yeah. The money still goes back. I mean, it's a normal contingency from that perspective. Well, so what Brenda's saying is that they don't have to deliver a uh, mortgage commitment. No, you just gotta say they want to remove it. Yeah. I'm okay with that. If they want to take the contingency out, then it's fine. I still suspect 
But even though the wording is kind of how it is, they don't have to give something formal. I still think that most of the attorneys that are overviewing these contracts are still going to insist on a clear close. So we're still going to probably get those requests for extensions, even though they got the basic approval. But I don't think the attorneys will give up their thinking as far as it's not approval until they have a full clear close. I don't think that's going to change in all their, their methods there. The other interesting one is this, which we don't have in RAR, is that 10 business days from the date of acceptance, if the buyer has failed to make a loan application, pay all fees. How often do we find out when they don't pay for the appraisal because they're not sure they have a solid loan? So in this case, if they don't pay the credit report and the appraisal fees and say, I'm moving forward with this, I'm giving it a good faith effort, and we've crossed 10 business days, your seller can get rid of them at that point. The seller's got the right to terminate. How's the seller going to know? Call the lender. Because the lender is in cooperation with this contract as well, too. If all the fees been paid, has this been done, has that been done? And this, they normally send out a letter too, I think, saying that they made full application. I think uh, at the time when they have to do the, um, what do you call it, Co uh, buyer's disclosure, they have to give the CD. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I, think, I like this part. I like the fact that you can't be just dragging your feet because you're not sure about your own loan at this point. Take it to the appraisal. I've had a hard time getting a letter to talk to you. Yeah, like Charlie call. <laughs> I'm sure they'll get a quick response. I think the lenders, because of this verbiage throughout this whole part in here, are going to be put to a different standard. I think they're going to have to figure out a way around that. Because of the, you know, assumed cooperation part that goes along with all of this will come into play. So, um, party causes late the loan process shall have the right to terminate under this. Party left to declare contract terminated. Uh, fun thing is that it's specific in here from the standpoint that there's no contingency funds at all. So the guys that play the game write up the contract with no home sale contingency, and yet they still have a house to sell. They know they got a house to sell. They just don't want to put in the contract because they want to be in a better advantage in a multi offer situation. Their financing clause comes back in, or approval comes back and says something to completion of the home doesn't cover them. In other words, they're now in, you know what? They're not enforcing the contract right. They didn't declare it right up front, therefore they no longer have financing protection under the fact that it says this. Their first claim is now in jeopardy. I mean, honestly, if this contract the way it's been drafted, go from the first claim. Because there's a, there's a whole, let's just put it, this contract gives your seller in many situations, a much better chance of getting the earnest money if somebody's not been totally upfront and truthful in how they present the contract to you in several places. So 500 bucks, a thousand, not enough. Go for more because there's a pretty good shot. They're gonna get the earnest money and they've got a pretty good claim for it if somebody's playing around and not performing properly. You know, Don't go in and do your loan. Hey, that puts you in default. Don't tell me about the home sale. That puts you in default. I mean, they've been pretty specific on what they're declaring within this contract for everybody. Does mention the FAG disclosure. We all know about that. Cash transactions. They broke it out because they look at it with them from the standpoint it's okay to go get a loan and pay cash. They made it very specific. Do not have to provide proof of funds unless reasonable request the seller says, I want you to prove it to me. So when I bring you the contract, I don't automatically have to have proof of funds. The seller has to ask for proof of funds, which we know we will do. You're gonna to wanna to know. It's where's the money at, which is the financial information, which is the bank it's at, who's holding it, and it is basically um, the authority to double check this stuff. Closing fee is getting split between the two. Now the other one that's in here that's kind of unique is I can make this a cash transaction 
but I'm still gonna leave you alone. Okay? Which is perfectly okay. I've had a lot of investors that have bought property. We write them as cash offers, they run down to a local bank. They're such strong individuals. They get a loan on the property. All of a sudden, at the closing table, we're sitting there, we're finishing up loan docs before we actually do the closing because they wrote it as a cash offer. This provision says it's okay to do that. We don't care because you're writing as a cash offer. So if you don't come through, your earnest money's at risk. But it also, in this provision that's included, the seller is agreeing to cooperate. Which means when the appraiser wants to get in there, the seller's saying it's okay to come look at the house. Now we've had some issues where nobody tells about nothing. It's written as a cash offer, and all of a sudden we get a showing request from an appraiser on our local contract. Well, on our local contract, you don't have to let them in. In theory, there's nothing in the contract that says you're gonna grant access other than a 40 hour inspection once they've crossed everything. This takes that discussion out of play because now we're automatically saying the seller will grant them access as needed to fulfill their obligations of the loan. Not bad. I'd rather know up front what I'm dealing with. So I think it's a pretty good paragraph to have for myself. Because I know I've been in, I've had a lot of deals over my years of business where this is exactly what happened. Heck, I've done this. To be honest with you, I have. In the days when we could get appraisals done and the equity counted in the appraisal before you know, the last 10, 12 years, I'd buy a house all the time with cash. Because I, I knew the value of it, I knew where I stood with the bank, and, I, and so they say, hey, I bought a house, we're closing in two weeks. They would love the two weeks part, but I forgot to come, but it still came in the fact that I did it a lot myself. We've all got investors we've worked with that are have gotten the capability of walking into their local bank, they have a personal banker who will issue them money. Good thing to be in. Don't just don't exist. And again, we're sharing the costs. So we're splitting the closing company costs. Uh, this is very similar. This is the difference for you guys with the prorations. The two other words they got in here, shall survive the closing. So when we close, this is basically saying that when it closes, if I've got any exemptions on the property, didn't keep them up, declared it, and we do all the prorations, and then all of a sudden the tax bill shows up, and we realize that you messed up, and you failed to file your senior exemption, different things got done wrong, your VA exemption got pulled, and you didn't tell nobody on it, and all of a sudden the tax bill that comes out is vacant, or there was some form of error, maybe in a homeowner's association. This basically is saying you're making a warranty again here as a seller that nothing has changed from contract to this point. So it survives the closing. That's different. Because in our contract, prorations are considered final in closing it. We don't go back and readjust nothing. This one, we're pretty much saying it, it better be right when we close. Disabled. Seller still is paying all the special assessments of clothing. That's pretty standard with them anymore. Attorney review. Yeah. I kind of wish ours had some kind of a phrase along this line too, and we'll see how it shakes out. But basically, attorney's review and home inspection, they're only five business days. So they only have five days for that attorney to actually look at the contract and give you a response back. But what it does do though, is it allows for up to 10 days for you to work out the details. After the five days? Yeah. Okay, so. So you have five days to get worked out, a total of 10 days to work out anything that's coming into play. Now this is actually kind of interesting as well. So my first five days comes into play, and basically the attorneys have simply approved the contract. The other thing is, is they could propose modifications or they can offer proposals. Now there's a difference in these. It seems kind of like, what are we talking about? But the one of them says proposed modification except for the purchase price. You can't get into purchase price changes. 
proposals shall be deemed a counteroffer. So in other words, this isn't the contract that's written up. We're suggesting this, this, this. This is literally saying we're proposing this modification and it's pretty much, I want it. We're not moving on this. It literally is a counteroffer type of a situation being presented back to them. So in that case, in those counteroffer scenarios, that's where we pick up the 10 business days after the date of acceptance to work things out. If it doesn't get worked out, then either party can terminate the contract. The offer proposals portion of it is, specifically referencing this, we shall not be considered a counteroffer. So we're just thinking that maybe it would be better if we did this or did this, and how do you think about this? So our proposal is not specifically referencing the subparagraphs, so you know, it just we think this would be a better way to rephrase this or word this or go with this. And they can accept it or not accept it. In theory, the way we're gonna probably look at this in all reality is when they send back the attorney letter, we're gonna probably look at them straight up. So we either work with it or we have 10 days to work it out. My suggest my thought is that most attorneys are gonna opt for calling it a modification in the contract because they're going to want to build in in five days to get it worked out. Okay. Um, Disapproval of modifications. Let me just look at that procurement that comes to this. I thought I'd get on that. Um, oh, one other quick thing on the attorney approval thing. The attorneys can't modify the contract in relation to time. There's a statement in there that says that irregardless of the proposal, they can't change the time factor inside of their own letters. They gotta stick to these time. Kind of interesting. So it's kind of a different thing. So I can't say this is a suggestion and I think I'm going on vacation for three weeks and you know we want to extend all the time frames. Their proposals can't modify the timing factor. They gotta get it figured out. Um, you can waive all the inspections. So if I don't want to do any of my home inspections, I can straight up front say we're not doing them. Which is nice, because how many times somebody said, I'm not gonna do home inspection. You negotiate the contract, they no big deal, we got through this whole process of stuff, and then all of a sudden, oh, they change their mind, and they still won't go do the home inspection. So now if somebody says, I don't want to do a home inspection with this form, you can put it right in here. And specifically say, we are waiving that inspection period time. Their inspection clauses are considerably more detailed than what we work with in terms of our contract in this state. And it allows for one or more licensed individuals, certified. Doesn't literally allow for Uncle Bill or Uncle Sam or anybody like that because it specifically is more licensed or certified inspectors. So we're not dealing with the local scenario. The utilities must be turned on, which be helpful in some cases, but the utilities need to be turned on, and only is going to cover major components. So they're they're pretty much saying we're dealing with the big stuff, which is central heating, cooling, plumbing, well, electrical, roof, walls, windows, doors, ceilings. And it's not talking about little light switches and all kinds of funky little things and loose hand railings and doorknobs. They're not dealing with that. They're saying right up front, this is for big stuff. And whatever they come back to you on, it's got to be under the guidelines that it's not a threat to health or safety. And the point is, is it doing its job or not? Age doesn't matter. Minor repairs, routine maintenance, and painting, decorating, other ones, they're all cosmetic. Don't come back to us or you don't like the color of this or that. So they've done a pretty good job of saying this is big rock major stuff going on and it better be not working at all or it's a safety issue. Don't. Some of the reports I've seen this last week are like, really? So are the banks going to be exempt from turning on utilities and their foreclosures? And I'm based on this. The bank signs this, their writer might override it though. How many banks will sign this contract in the home? Yeah. If they sign this contract, they have to have turned on. But their writer will change it. So, uh, 
fire transfer credit, repairs, violation terms, they're saying they can work with it. So it's back to negotiating because they find other things beyond that. Oh, automatically off radon, this is another thing. We don't have this built into ours, we have to include it in our writers at this point. Radon retest is automatically upon the seller. Don't have to get in that little detail. There's a lot of little stuff in some of the little short lines within this contract you gotta be aware of. Okay. Uh, moving on from that, basically, my request needs to be done five days again. So they're doing fast inspections. Five days for the inspection to be done, 10 days for us to figure it out to resolve any inspection issues we might have and how we're gonna move forward. Uh, buyer can give notice within that five days, contract can go and void, or if the buyer fails to conduct the inspection, you waive all his rights to it. No coming back eight days later and saying, oh, we're scheduling an inspection. They have to do it within the time frame, or it's automatically they're waiving their rights to continue to move forward, which is kind of a good thing because we've had that happen as well too. Where somebody runs late, and they just think the date is not a suggested time. No, doesn't work. Homeowners insurance. Fall back on their attorney to extend it. That's probably what would happen. And then we had to decide if they're strong and fired. And why was the reason couldn't get somebody out? I mean, let's think. Look at the weather we've had the last 30 days, guys. If you had an inch of ice, blizzards, could you imagine doing a home inspection when we had those 50 mile an hour winds and the guy was booked the next two or three days and there's, there's, there will be those points that still come up where we have to be realistic and honest about what's taking place in, our, in that moment in time. And you may need to agree to some extensions. You might have to do some things. Because what's in the best interest of your client? Stuff happens. I mean, half this office, you know, somebody's sick, that one's sick, this is up, whatever else. You look at Holly the other day, she made the comment about unsafe conditions where you walk up to a house mm -hmm. and she was canceling inspections because she didn't want to break an ankle. I mean, I understand that kind of stuff. There's things that need to happen in the normal course of stuff to make the house reasonably accessible for inspectors as well. You, there's always going to be variables, and that's why it's real estate. That's why they need us, because the variables that come into play. Ah, uh, homeowners in search. This guy is becoming a bigger, bigger thing out there. That paragraph, I suspect, will wind up in, <coughs> not maybe not that paragraph, but some version of it, I can see <coughs> winding up inside of our, our contracts moving forward. Because the insurance industry has become much more aware of what's going on. I just had a call from somebody yesterday. Sellers got the money, brand new roof, cash check, didn't fix the roof. I said, you gotta disclose it. Why? Well, deal with it now. Because the minute the new buyer goes to get the insurance, they're gonna find out that there was a insurance claim, a brand new roof on that house, the roof wasn't put on, the new insurance company probably won't insure the property because there should be a new roof on there and there isn't one. Wow. So you gotta find something up front to make sure it's what it is. Because the insurance industry guys, they have their crew report. It's just like a credit report on every property that's out there. What and they include the your clients too. What if the seller doesn't disclose that? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna get the phone call. The realtor will get the phone call. Yeah. You as a listing is gonna get the phone call saying my buyer can't get insurance because there's supposed to be a brand new roof on that house and for whatever they can determine there's no brand new roof on that house. That happens. So the kind of thing is kind of what it's been. It doesn't change a whole lot. The only difference is that there's an extra time in contract where I just bust stuff into a writer as well as the contract. So we're gonna spend time on that right now. Um, Basically, this one is five business days after received documents. So they got an automatic built-in date for, for the buyer to decide. Do you like this or don't like this? As far as the kind of that goes. Um, the deed. Record 
Trevor Warren from E, nothing really changes there. Transfer staff doesn't come into play. Compliance with codes. This is much, yeah, we can spend some time on this because this could be an interesting thing. Buyers are cautioned the real estate may be situated for this value that has adopted a pre closing inspection or disclosure requirement for municipal transfer tax or similar ordinances. Cost of the transfer taxes, inspection fees, and repairs required by the inspector to the municipality and ordinances shall be paid by the party designated by the and so forth. Because the ordinances might say we can pay into this or not paying that. We don't have that here yet. We've got certain little areas where before you even list the property, I think Davis is like that now. I should I had double check that. But we're seeing some communities out there and I'll say you've got to do the clear waters inspection before you put the property on the market. That's a part of their ordinances. So it's one thing we should be starting to watch a little bit more up front. But if you start selling some property more in certain areas within the Chicago area, there's a burden out there. They literally do have re-inspections by the building departments. I mean, it's probably had a couple where they've had to do the re-inspections. So it's not only the home inspector you gotta get past, you gotta get by the building inspector. They had to do that and redo it with somebody. We had a buyer that was buying our property yep. was selling theirs and they had to like well, yep. redo the whole thing. And they had to wait until the buyer closed them up. And don't freak out if you ever hear an attorney call up saying, I need my perp done. I don't remember who asked me, what's a perp done? <laughs> this is the foreign trade training for thing. It's not exactly one of those things we talk about every day, but we did have an attorney specifically on our contract still ask for this. So it's the Foreign Investment Real Estate Property Tax Act. You're declaring whether or not you're foreign is what it really comes down to. <coughs> but the attorney asked for it prior to the closing. And this is a pretty detailed attorney for my first action one time. Here's Tyler Ward. I wish these two were almost flipped because we talked about the survey. Now, here's the thing, guys. It asks for an all the title insurance policy. Our RAR contract doesn't. The difference is you can't do an all the insurance policy, which covers against encroachment, easements, boundary dispute lines, fences in wrong places, garages over things, everything that comes along with play. Without a survey, the title company will not give you a full all the policy. I've had attorneys from the Chicago area claim we, as agents and attorneys out here, are basically guilty of malpractice, is the term they use, because we allow people to close without doing surveys and getting a full all policy. Because that's like doing surgery and forgetting to close the person back up. That was his words, because you haven't done the whole benefit of helping these people out. So that's why if you don't do the survey, you think you're gonna just cross it out, can't even fulfill the contract. So you might get caught. You think you're being, you know, protecting your client, saving a few dollars, and you try to take out the survey portion of it, then guess what, guys? You just put them in a jeopardy. That's now they're gonna pay for it no matter what. You gotta have the survey in order to provide the title insurance goes with it. <clears throat> just understand that they tie tie together big time. I mean here's the thing, guys. Apply the survey. They want one, that was the one business they part of closing. I think that's a little crazy because if there's problems on it, that's not enough time to work anything through or have an open discussion. We do have a fence in the wrong place or something that comes into play. It's gotta be dated within six months. All the corners gotta be visibly spaked or flagged. Monument, witnesses, corner, everything's gonna play. It's not a mortgage inspection, which is just, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> the house are made there. <laughs> So it has to be a fully boundary survey, not just a simple one. Here's the short of this whole thing on the surveys. The reason they cost so much is, one, it's by man. But the real difference is, is they have to go so far to start. Where if Carmen's house was being surveyed today, and then tomorrow they survey the one across the street, they have to be the same surveyor, or the one down the block happens to be the same surveyor, or these guys start to develop a trust amongst themselves when they see other guys' survey markers, they work with them. Now, I'm not going out a mile, mile and a half to find a true monument and surveying a mile and a half away to get to your house. Because I'll use my own markers right across the street to do the survey. 
Uh, broom clean condition. Here's another one, folks. Cell survived the closing. So again, when your seller makes representations, and those representations are regarding to zoning building violations, pending rezoning, boundary line disputes, and a pending eminent domain, easements, hazardous waste, real estate, or any improvements to real estate which require a final permit without a paint. Your seller is warranting this and it survives the closing. So you think you're sneaking by because I did this beautiful rec room in the basement. And then the buyer goes and pulls a permit to add in a bathroom downstairs. And they show up to do the inspection in the building department and they say, well, when did you do all of this? And the buyer says, I didn't do this. We bought it like this. Guess what? No permits were pulled. And they don't know. Think about it from the standpoint, we do a great job of taking pictures, guys. We do an awesome job of taking pictures. And we always do the rec room, right? And we do the fancy deck that they forgot to pull permits in. We do all the stuff that they didn't pull permits on are on the pictures. I mean, we literally are setting it up where the building department can just go through and look at all of our stuff if they wanted to. Oh, they did. I called Realtor.com too and called the wrong agent to complain about it. I got one of those calls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm not the listing agent. Get to the yeah. info that you're about. So oh. this is a strong thing. And I don't know where this is going to wind up even inside of our future art contracts or not. But we need to be aware of this. This is the reason why this contract may not be the right contract right now for anybody that's done work. So if you have a house, you ask them who did the rec room, were the permits hold, were things done properly? And they say, nope. Did it myself. Yeah, did it myself. Wasn't there some so improvements you could do yourself though? <laughs> Huh? Isn't there some improvements you could do yourself? You can do kind of repair the place, just don't be tearing all walls and doing things. Okay. Now, you get down to Boone County, Belvedere, for example, they want a permit for everything. <laughs> uh -huh. Anything on the exterior of the house, you're pulling a permit. If you're not pulling walls in internally, moving walls around, you don't need to be permitting that. So, what should we do? So, I can change a light switch, I can move the toilet, do things like that. But if they start getting into anything siding, roofing, Anything on the exterior in Boone County, Belvedere, they pull on permit. Special assessments, things like that, we got that. They make these statements again at closing. So if something changes in regard to special improvements, pending special assessments, this is basically saying seller representation is being remade as a closing. So yeah, it's doing the same contract. So it's the same thing as saying. We're moving forward and we're giving you a warranty. Everything we told you at this point is actually still going past the closing. They've done, they've done a lot on this contract to take the seller game here, but on the other hand, they're now saying, yeah, just because you walked away from the closing table, don't think you're off the hook because we're assuming you made the truthful statements throughout the entire contract, and if you did, we'll be back. It'll be back to watch. Yeah. Our current contracts pretty much everybody gets up and moves away from the table. I mean, unless it was blatant, you know, misrepresentation or fraud, you pretty much get up, walk off the table, it's done. Once you leave the table, we're done. Right? This is basically for properties that have not been taxed or any 3% purchase price. Is what they're going with new construction. They don't think they're putting in play. Tax escrow, business hours, their hours are different. Ours is business days. They've clarified their days to stop at six o'clock. So apparently they've got the attorney's degree to work a little bit later or something. I don't know, but the business day is now six o'clock, <coughs> not five o'clock. Um, starts the day after. It automatically moves the date. That's what's unique about this one. If you're closing a loan condition date falls upon a non-business day, it actually automatically moves immediately to the next business day. So if you have messed up on your calendar, <laughs> they fixed it in the on the contract for you. I got it before. Well, yeah, we don't Labor Day or something. Like trying yes. digital around it and that. Fourteen days is worth of earnest money. Here's your earnest money stuff. 
It gives literally the escrow holder, us, in the event of a dispute. We can literally give written notice to both of the parties in the contract 14 days prior to it and say, this is how we intend to distribute the earnest money. Nobody objects. We can distribute the earnest money. So instead of going to arbitrations and all that other stuff that comes into play, we can basically say, this is how the earnest money should be dispersed. Either one can object. If they do object to that state of the game, and then it falls back to the courts. So, so the courts are arbitration? Courts. There are no arbitration oh, wow. in the It goes right to the courts. So you better agree because you're going to yep. eat it all up anyways in court costs. Oh, no doubt. No. Because then you get <coughs> you know, your play costs and all this kind of stuff. I kind of like this because how often it's somebody just refusing to sign off on your money, right? Mm -hmm. That's what most of them are. Had phone call today. Somebody filed the arbitration claim. Agent calls and says, "Do we have to go through all this?" I says, "Who should get the earnest money?" Well, it probably should go back to the seller because my buyer is pretty much didn't do nothing. Changed his mind. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what they do. If he wants to fight it, he's gonna put up another. 250 from our contract, if he loses, he not only loses the earnest money, but he also loses the 250. Okay. I'll talk to him. Same time. Yeah. So it's one of those things that once it files with the arbitration, we're finding out that at that stage of the game, most of them tend to get settled. We actually have had one, though, that went all the way through the whole process. Our client got their money back. The other part never even showed up. Didn't pay the money, so it automatically defaulted from the, the judgment standpoint. But this really does kind of simplify it. That the escrow we can give notice. They all have the right to say yes or no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll do this with certified mailings, receipts, everything else to prove it. But that's not a bad part of the contract. Um, Notices should be in writing. This is what I said, guys. When it comes to notices, it shall be in writing. It shall be served by one party or attorney or other party or attorney. Nowhere does it say agents in here as far as the ability to receive notices. That's a big change in how we just presume that the business is going to take place because you're not authorized to receive the notices. So when you're playing attorney and your client doesn't have an attorney it's a strong statement you gotta make you know I can't receive your notices not in this contract but you can get the courtesy copy in your hand but uh, mailing email fax all the things you spelled out date time of email transmission those are pretty common with what we look at uh, I like this one. If party fails to provide contact information required notice to be served upon the party's designated agent in any manners provided above. So if you fail to put their information in, you by default become the one responsible. Personally, if you're broker, I don't like that. I still think you guys got to make sure we have contact information. I don't care which contract it is, get that contact information on that contract for your clients. There's no secret to that point. My gosh, if I'm signing a contract with you, they're really, who, who am I pretending not to be? I'm buying your house. Why am I afraid to give you my email address? Or my contact information? It's on my earnest money check where I live. Right, and but the way I understand it is that other realtors, when they're making the offer, they're afraid that you know, you're gonna steal their client or yeah. something of that nature. And they, not if you have the proper designated agent form to fill out. You know, who's going to do that? You know, I think I've been a little hesitant at times where the buyer and seller have each other's emails and they're communicating mm -hmm. amongst themselves and we are not aware. I like thought personal happens. property and all of a sudden <laughs> they're ticked off about the price of the mower and you don't even know what they're talking about. It'll happen, but this all they got to do is get in their car and go drive over there. Mm -hmm. So I'm either making it a little bit harder or I'm making it easier for them. They're still going to do it. 
if you got that client who's gonna engage you regardless, they're gonna do it one way or another. I'm all, my thought on this is just make it easier for you guys to say some of the liability is on you. That's my point. Because why do you want 100% liability for receiving all these notices and you miss one? My gosh, you come down with the flu for two, three days and something's critical and it gets shipped to you at six o'clock and they meet the deadline for the notices of getting it to you. You can't even move. And nobody else can get it to your client. You're so sick, you can't even call somebody up and tell them to look at your email and cover for you. And you were the only one that could get that notice and now the whole thing falls apart. How do you think the client's gonna feel? You really in hot water. Because they think we're invincible if we have a life. Right. <laughs> you know, or you're traveling. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of situations that mm. don't be afraid of that. If you've got your client's trust and respect, you should be okay. Confirmation dual agency, I think it's crazy where they bury this, but it's there. The sale of property, this is not too crazy for what they have before. It does have a lot more detail in it, which is basically it's the question we ask anyway, right? What are we doing here? What do we do here? How do we do it here? Is it on the market? Not on the market. Are you listing it? Who's going to be listing it? This stuff is all spelled out inside of here for this contract. I think she's based on home sale. It's pretty straight. Notice to serve is not. It's pretty straightforward on how they word this stuff in here. You wait. The contingency in here for the right to continue to show the property. Right to continue to show the real estate offer for subject. You can put the hours in. Show them your choice is how it goes. Shall we serve upon the buyer? not the attorney nor buyer's real estate agent. So it's very similar to what you've got now. It has to go to the parties. So again, this is another point. If I don't have their contact information, how do I serve it? And, and the separate period is 24 hours. You can negotiate. I would tell you to tighten it up beyond 72. I think 72 hours is just a stall. If I don't have my Financing arranged. I can't do a bridge on it. I'm not going to do it in 72 hours, anyways. Mm -hmm. You're either ready to perform at that stage of the game when you receive the notice or you're not. Mm -hmm. I don't see a need to be pushing it out for 72 hours just for you to think about it and hope your house sells to a cash buyer who can give you a 100% deposit and puts it in an escrow account. I mean, that's literally what it would take to satisfy mm -hmm. the home sale between C and Rob. We don't have that. You know, it's not probably going to ever happen. But it actually has its own method of describing how you can provide notice here outside of the regular notice side too. Being one of them, if we cover this in real detail right now, you probably would remember it anyways until you actually got in that situation. <laughs> but it's pretty, it's very well spelled out. Um, I love this one. Fire waves any ethical objection to delivery and notice under the paragraph by some attorney representatives. So everybody can deliver the notice, and you can't come back and file a grievance on me because they had contact with your clients. So the contract actually gives permission under this part of the care paragraph to have direct connection to those clients. So as we can't stall you out because we're afraid to go talk to or deliver notices to somebody. I think that's a good line. I think that's the way it should be too. Um, we have contingencies, they get up the money in here too. So my page one, when I put in the earnest money and stuff, might have said thousand bucks, another three thousand bucks at the time when the approvals would come through, attorney pool, attorney pool, it takes place. But I can also ask for additional money at the time of the bump. So I got potentially have asked for more earnest money multiple times with inside of this contract. And I think this is critical. Because if you accept the home sale contingency today and our RAR contract, don't have this ability to do that, and all of a sudden they do come through the paperwork, you're still only responsible for the earnest money, you're only real damages. You get a hole in it from the perspective. Now if I've got the money, and I'm proving to you I have the money, then cough up a little extra. So we don't have to chase you down and come get it. So, 
Don't skip this paragraph. It might make your sellers a lot happier if something goes wrong. You know? And it's a little easier. Because now it's money instead of just bringing me a piece of paper that says I get a loan in place. Money is going to be a little bit harder to walk away from at that point. Uh, cancellation by contract, home mortgage in here. There's actually provision in the front of that so because there's a home mortgage or not right up front. Well and septic, understand that well and septic is stronger here. Not only does it have to pass the normal test, but the well actually has to deliver no less than five gallons of water per minute. Grab a five gallon bucket, turn on a hose, let it be full in five minutes. And that actually we've got a little bit later on throughout the whole process. I'm really appreciate that some wells will slow down, dry up. I can see my too. Yeah, in our um, local well, uh, well and septic inspectors do not do that part no more. So you have to let them know it's on this contract. They need to know. They have to flow test as well. Yeah, so that's what I'm on that. License environmentalists, not more than 90 days old. If something's wrong, they're automatically agreeing to fix up to $3,000 for the seller. <coughs> so it's a little bit deep in the game right up front. Um, and they need to get at least 10 days prior to closing. So this is get it under contract. You probably should be getting this thing scheduled and getting it planned. possession code pre built in price if it's left blank 2%. So if the sellers are going to stay, 2% of the money gets to stay in an escrow account to ensure that they will not cause you damage and they'll get out. Or whatever amount you want to figure out from here. Plus, it allows you for a little pre built data here. This used to have a figure at one time, but it's blank now. So you determine what the daily rate will be when you stay there. As is, uh, it spells out a little bit easier. As is condition as day of the offer. So nothing can change when I see it that day. Buyer acknowledges that no representations, warranties, or guarantees with respect to condition of real estate have been made by seller or seller presenting the agent other than those known defects, if any, disclosed by seller. Buyer may conduct a buyer dispense any inspection they wish to conduct. So the inspection clause is spelled out within here. In the event seller should make real estate available for buyer's inspection, so forth and so on, buyer's owner shall include a copy of the inspection report. So they can still do an inspection. So if I'm buying it as is, this paragraph actually takes out the home inspection paragraph and it replaces it <coughs> with this one. Because I'm selling to you as is, they've done a pretty good job spelling this out. So this is as is, do your inspection, and then just simply tell me yes or no. That's about how this really does spell out. Don't send me the inspection report, which we see a lot in this area. Do your inspection, but don't send me the report. You know, kind of like they want to bury their head in the sand and ignore anything that might be wrong with the property. They want to change the disclosures in your environment. That's so right. <laughs> so, but I think this does a pretty good job of that because it's saying it is what it is. It's very similar to a lot of the REO clauses. Do your inspection, figure out where you stand. You have five business days to do that, and then basically just tell us yes or no. But don't send me the report. I don't want to hear about anything being wrong. Don't even call me about that. Buying or not buying. I wish our as is clause was more like this because it would make it a little bit easier to understand exactly what we're talking about. We'll see. Our contract's up for review. Attorney, party for approval? I like this one. I always have it like this. How many times do you show the house to the kids? They have to show <coughs> their parents, and you know they're going to be in a multiple offer situation, and the parents can't even get here for two more days. I mean, this is, I like this one a lot. Always have like that paragraph because you can write the contract, make it subject to the parents. What are we gonna, Uncle Bill, I don't care what you got put in here or who, but at least I can be in the game and we can be negotiating to get 
everything worked out. Yeah, or just even court approval. Yeah, something like that. You know? Yep. I mean, whatever situation is, it's very open on that. You know, and it gives you five days of acceptance to get it done. So it spells out the dates. I like that with this whole contract that on most spaces, we don't have to have the crystal ball and figure out the dates. They've already given us dates. And most, I think the dates are pretty fair. I think they're reasonable what they put in here. They, even though this contract is already up to page 12, there's still a lot of stuff that you could add in here. Short sales aren't leaving multi-units, tax deferred. So there's a bunch of stuff that comes into play within the contract itself. There's simple writers, but most of these you won't use them except for exactly what they spell them out to be. If you guys did notice, they do actually the initial every single page. So it does take a little bit more when you drop this into an e-signature platform than you do it again to sign an initial every place you gotta go with it. So. Um, I like this. Anybody that signs this, the parties represent the text of this copy of the form has not been altered. It is identical to the official multi board residential real estate contract 7.0. You know what that tells you? The people that wrote this contract changed verbiage, had somebody sign it, caused situations because the verbiage was changed, and basically played attorneys. I've seen that happen in the past. Oh, I've seen it. Like, like, I'd say maybe I've seen it in the early 2000s where, like, I've seen it on the broker. Broker owners who were just a one independent guy or something modified their yeah. contracts and stuff. Um, keep in mind that this thing, their contract still does not have an accept by date. Mm -hmm. This contract literally hangs open until you either say we'll pull our offer or until it gets accepted. There is no to be accepted by date on here. There's no one on here to sign for earnest money. That gets done in a different format than that one. And the obvious thing down below, so it says for informational only, you can add in here anytime from that point down anything you want to add in here throughout the contract, and you don't have to get initials. So <coughs> it's pretty specific. Buyer side, seller side, attorneys, attorneys, mortgage company, loan officer, condo associations, and they do have a spot here, which now is Illinois law, right? saw that on my little email too about you don't give them proof they presented the contract if it's required or requested from you. So they'd actually put this one. Illinois real estate law requires all of you present time and prior request verification is also presented. They don't even make it optional. So our contract or our contract currently has that spot on there for what we present to the contract. There's nothing binding upon that. Nothing binding. They don't want to sign it, they don't have to sign it. This, because the contract the way it was written, said right on here, the buyer can request a verification of the documents presented. The law doesn't say it has to be your seller who initials. They defaulted to it being the seller. The law's pretty much agents got to tell. So is it a rejection if you're countering that? Oh, it is. So you get put if you're countering it's rejected. I would treat it as a counter. I would leave this out of the stage of the game. This is just that flat out where we're directing your contract. That's what the intent is behind this. So we're not even getting into negotiation. We're not countering or doing our This is flat out. We've got multiple offers, or your offer is so bad. I seen it, I looked at it, it's out. Yeah, I mean, even on this one. I, I, don't, I don't know if they're behind it, but they've never even put in there a statement to the effect that it was counter or not counter or anything to that point. So, so should you have your seller sign it then, if you're covering it? I would. You're signing it and you're initialing and dating it like anytime else you would do an initial and counter. You're just not putting any kind of a date of acceptance. This is a very good form where the electronic signature, in my opinion, really helps. Because you're lacking all those dates of countering, acceptance, counter by, going back and forth. 
the electronic signature will automatically create that time frame for you that it was nine o'clock and then you did it at eight o'clock and you did this and did this and you have to track the time frame as to how those additions occurred and how those counts take place. We don't have that time frame to be rebuilt inside of there now. That's 7.0. Time possession. Okay, possession is after all the keys are handed over and mm -hmm. the house is vacated. Right. Okay, so do they just respond? In most cases, somebody they probably will. Somebody's gonna have a discussion on that before they get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> My suggestion with you, if you don't have keys, they haven't vacated, don't disperse funds. You got no leverage. I mean, at that stage of the game, if the possession thing has come into play and it's in question, you might find out how long they're planning on being there or not being there. Mm -hmm. You might be putting back in the post possession agreement. Holding money in escrow. You've got verbiage inside of this contract that literally will tell you what you're dealing with as far as. I mean, you've got verb here that kind of lays out the accepted form of how much money should be held in escrow. You've got some guidelines already pre-established. I guess what it is, too. Yeah. Is it something I can deal with? I had my own girl told that at the closing, the guy gave us the keys and everything. Uh, we did the uh, walkthrough the night before, and we were still packing. Yep. He wasn't out there. No. came back to the house, they found him in the house the days after. What? Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, it was. That's changed a lot fast. Mm -hmm. yeah, we should recommend that they really change up a lot. That's what I think. You know what? Contracts are great. They're designed for what they're intended. We're always going to have some difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Because of people. That's why we're in the business and we got to deal with people and everybody's going to have different options and thoughts and Alrighty. Well, thanks. Now, look, guys.